Hello, everyone. I'm Debbie Schwartz. I'm a vice president at Mavenspire, and I am thrilled to welcome you guys to Mavenspire's virtual foodie event, Numbing the Pain of Digital Transformation. Uh, we know at Mavenspire, we see with our clients all the time that the explosive growth in data is causing people a lot of stress. And the Mavenspire way to help with stress is good advice, good food, and good wine. And if you work with us, you'll know those are, uh, those are always around. So today, uh, we are going to start with, um, with Michael Tannenhaus, who's our CEO, who's going to tell us uh, five steps to harnessing your data. And then we are going to move on to delicious, cheesy Georgian bread and wine. Uh, for this session, we do have a Q&A set up. So if, you, if Michael's talking and you have questions, uh, feel free to just put them through and we will get them answered. Uh, also, you'll see this is interactive. We do have a few polls. So this will be a participatory event. So with that, I will introduce our CEO, Michael Tannenhaus. Take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm really excited about this event, but I have to say that, you know, it, I used to joke there's nothing worse than being right before lunch or right before dinner. Actually, right before cheesy bread and wine is not so great if you think about it. So I will try to um, offer my few thoughts for you and then uh, get on to Jonathan and Cheesy Bread because I'm right there with you. Hold on. Oh, that's them. All right. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is that um, Technology is a really interesting thing. It, it tends to come in waves. It tends to recycle. There's, there's a big joke about how we don't invent new technology, we recycle from the 60s. Um, but what is true is that it's an unrelenting force. And so the first thought that I want to offer you today, the first step is that I want to encourage everyone to practice acceptance and, and faith and maybe even face their fear um, and understand that what is really going to happen in an age where data just keeps doubling and doubling and doubling is that people are going to come to you with requests all the time. Um, if you're not within IT, if you're, if you're a constituent, then you're going to have new needs for storing data all the time. You're going to actually be identifying new types of data all the time. And the kind of the traditional attitude for this has always been to kind of push back and, and sort of slow things down and get people to think about what they're trying to do. And we've actually sort of entered an age now where innovation and uh, rapid change and, and data-driven decisions have become the norm, if not the goal. And so we really do have to start working towards a culture of yes. Um, if you look at this chart, Oh, go Hold ahead. On. I'm sorry. She has a poll. Do we first? Yeah, it's time for our first interactive uh, event here. We want to know uh, if you are experiencing what Michael is talking about. So we've got a poll here. And we've got Getting some interesting results. All right, gonna give it like 30 more seconds. Come on, everyone, click the button. We're not allowed That's to vote. Right. 
participate. All right, so that's where we that's where we got. Uh, for our group, it's either grown moderately or it's doubled. Okay. Well, good news, everyone. You are right on the average. Mm -hmm. So if you actually take a look at the growth of data, um, not even very specifically, but the, the growth of data worldwide, um, it looks like this. Um, what's really interesting about charts like this is they're done by some of the big analyst firms and they're updated probably every month or so. Um, the, the slope of the curve just gets bigger. Right. So in 2018, I was sitting around talking to a group of executives and we were having a conversation about big data. And one of the executives looked up and said, you know, honestly, big data doesn't keep me up at night because when people talk about big data, I at least understand the unit of measurement. So the stuff is really worrying me is the when people start talking about zettabytes and, you know, things I can't even wrap my head around. I, I feel like that's more like WTF data. And that's what's got me a little scared. And so if you look at this curve, interestingly enough, you know, in 2018, we were what, around worldwide data set of 20 zettabytes. Here we are at 2021. I actually believe this curve is conservative, right? Because the number is around 100 right now. And it's moving up at a very rapid pace. <laughs> Just consider the idea that from today at say 40 on this graph to 2025 at 180 on this graph, that's a lot of data. And conceiving of a zettabyte is a very difficult thing to do. That is just unbelievable amounts of data. More than the world had, you know, in 2016. Kind of crazy, right? All right, so my first thought then is that we, we just need to accept, right? We've got one more question. So that was about. So you got a question out there. We've definitely got consistency here. Yeah. If I was taking the poll, I'd say yes. Well, you know, if if you've ever been in a room with the IT teams and they're arguing about whether to mail them to name the mail server file server, you know you have problems, right? So this poll was a hundred percent. True. Yep. And that is one way that uh, that the data gets so big, right, Michael? Well, it's not so much that it gets so big. It's that we, we don't understand what is data or where it hides. Uh, what makes it big, honestly, is a, is a couple of things. It, it, specific to that question, duplication is big. When people mail stuff around, what tends to happen is multiple copies of it start existing. And you start getting into a world where there's 15 copies of everything. But probably the, the harder thing for people these days is, you know, I'm very commonly asked and ask people, what is the cloud? Because it's one of those marketing terms that have like 100 different meetings and everybody has a different one. Um, I less commonly get asked, what is data? And, but I have found asking that question has yielded some very different responses. Um, because most people think about the files they email around or the data that they share with another. They don't, some people bring in video cameras, like security camera footage. Some people talk about databases that they store data into. Um, there's just a lot of things. Data is a, is a generic term. And so if you're looking at all of the things that can be data from you know, personnel records to customer data to um, buying patterns to, you know, the augmented reality engine that lets you play Minecraft in 3D. Those are all different forms of data and they're enormous. Um, you know, one of the interesting events I attended recently is I was at an event with, with where there was a director, a guy named James Cameron, which many of you may be familiar with. 
And he was talking about the differences between filming the movie Avatar and filming its sequel, which they're doing now. And the, you know, the first movie, the Avatar, came out to be a petabyte when it was all said and done. Like the whole movie is about a petabyte. The, the sequel is still two years away and is double digit petabytes. And it's just enormous, the change of how much space everything takes when you add more effects or more detail or um, you have the capability to produce effects that couldn't have been done two months ago, a year ago, just because of the addition ability of compute. Um, you have the public cloud, the scalable cloud where you can put ephemeral workers together and you can solve problems around genetics and genomics and you can push through vaccine research in months instead of years. And these are all things that just weren't, it's not like we invented new technology, we just did it a different way. And it just kind of accelerated everything. So now what is data is all of those things that were impossible to do before becoming possible. And this chart is just sort of one of those ones to kind of get people thinking about where are all the places data might be coming from and where might they be going? It's just a, it's a very big picture these days. That's one of the things that makes it bigger and complicated. All right, I think we've got another question for the group here. So kind of following up on uh, Michael's chart, uh, you can choose more than one of these. If your organization is talking about these things, tell us about it. So all but one of those is on the 2021 CIO priority list for the, um, the other one was on the 2020 CIO priority list. Which one isn't on the list this year? Security cameras. It was on last year because there was the big run to convert security cameras to also read temperature off people hmm. um, for pandemic response. And so now that we're sort of beyond the wave of that, it's no longer the priority. It's assumed to either be done or not necessary. So the only thing we're not seeing in the polling results is autonomous equipment and security cameras. Everything else is represented in the poll. Yeah, what's really interesting about autonomous equipment is it's a big fancy word, but like I think most people bought themselves a pandemic gift. My pandemic gift to myself is a robotic lawnmower and it just mows the lawn all the time. It's autonomous, right? It just, it calls me if it needs me, but otherwise my lawn is completely mowed every day, all day long. And it's out there at night and it's out there in the rain and it just mows the lawn, right? And um, I think sometimes when we see words like autonomous system, we think about self-driving cars and maybe the high end, but the, the, the real interesting thing for me has been watching the pervasive change on the low end. Um, you know, Roomba to mower has been a span of years. And now, you know, what the next thing of that will be, we're now starting to see prime delivery with drones, right? Autonomous systems um, and self-driving and all of that. And, and being able to call an Uber or Lyft that doesn't have a driver, those are the next wave down the road. Okay, so let's talk about data location. So why data location is, is, is such a big thing, why right? it's such a big hurdle, is that, well, data can reside in a lot of different places. And more importantly, because the definition of data means different things to different people, if you literally turn to five peers and said, could you give me a copy of all your data? Whether you get all the data or not is relevant. It, well, it's relative to how they interpreted the request. Some people might try to get out a thumb drive and copy their hard drive. Some people might try to um, you know, give you just a couple of files from their document directory. When you're, when you're actually looking at it from an organizational point of view, if you're thinking about the data is the memory of the organization and all of you know, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, you are looking for all the data in all the silos. And you know, you're also looking for the definition of data at the same time. And so you're, you, you start 
you know, kind of the journey by looking at all the types of storage out there. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, if you're walking into a data center or a computer room, the things that look like storage, hard drives, SANs, that sort of stuff, you can see them. And so then you want to inventory those. If you're looking at, you know, like public cloud bills, you know, there's storage out there, so you can go find those as well. But, you know, I've also worked in medical research where the way they archived experiments is they went literally down the street to like uh, Best Buy and bought 250 external USB drives. And they kept 250 different experiments kind of in rotation on these drives. And there are still organizations that operate that way. I, I've seen it in media, in marketing. I've seen it in medical research and probably other research as well, where they just didn't know any better. So they made up the solution that worked. Location of the storage. Are we talking about stuff that is in the computer room, in somebody's computer, on their phone, in their tab, down the street? Um, at a branch office, like all of these things create um, a lot of complexity in trying to kind of figure out where everything is. Number of copies. So if you're if you're trying to get a, a grasp on the size of data, you want to know if it's it's copied. But sometimes it's required that it's copied. When you do applications that stretch across the country, sometimes you want multiple copies of data in the east and in the west, and those are important things. Um, let's see, who gets to see it? Who, what happens when things go wrong? Um, the kinds of applications, are we talking about databases? Are we talking about security systems? Are we talking about file servers? Are we talking about SharePoint? All of these different things generate different kinds of telemetry data in completely different ways. Just like my lawnmower does completely different stuff than say my computer, or at least I hope it does. So one of the big, you know, obviously, in, in the previous thought, what I was talking about is, you know, where's the data coming from in all the different ways? Well, you know, sometimes people call that an input device or a sensor, you know, trying to figure out all the different ones that you have to watch, that can be a little difficult. And so um, kind of getting a map of all of those different ways that data is coming in and data is going out, um, where your users are. And then finally, the archival methods that people use, are they shipping tapes? Or you know what kind of, of, of storage is being used for aging data, and what is the requirement around that? There are people who have to keep things a hundred years, and I can tell you, a hundred years ago, USB drives were not a thing. So you have um, people still who have like microfiche or even you know even paper that is still data, and you have to be able to do something with it. So data mapping is, is the process of kind of, of having that asset inventory of everything that you have and all of the metadata around it that makes it useful. All right, one more question. So how much of your data have you actually inventoried? And I would say that you know, whether you've done a formal data mapping exercise or whether you were just involved in something where you were just trying to get your arms around what needed to be, you know, considered data, both of those are legitimate. Sometimes people get into these projects uh, of kind of mapping stuff because they're working with security and security wants to have classifications of data so they know what the crown jewels are versus what's not the crown jewels. Um, and so some people kind of back into it. So what I'm seeing here on the poll is that uh, definitely the idea of a data inventory is not a widespread thing, but uh, some are doing some inventorying, but nobody feels like they've got everything uh, accurately inventoried. Hence the need for cheesy bread and wine. Yes, exactly. All right, so if just to kind of set the stage here, the reason that I'm excited about data, the reason that a lot of the people that I talk to are very excited about data is not because they really care about the data. It's kind of ironic, right? What they care about is what the data can do for them. 
And so um, monetizing data has become a huge race. It's a competitive race. It's a race to kind of define new experiences. It's a race to automation. It's a, it's a race. So if we look at um, you know, some of the data around that on the next slide, So, you know, I, I don't believe in reading slides to people, but I, I, I do like to throw them up there. You can see that there's a lot of partnerships between um, chief data officers, financial officers. I would even say that there's huge partnerships between chief marketing officers and sales officers. And honestly, there's a lot of partnerships going on all over organizations. And the reason is the, 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 the dream of data is to convert data to dollars. And how you do that is either in one of two ways in traditional business. Either you make more revenue or you reduce costs. And so every part of an organization gets involved in this. You know, if you look at the rise of IoT and operations, facilities management, the ability to save money on utility bills, the ability to turn lights on when you're not there, all of that sort of stuff from the most primitive out to the ability to do complex control of environmental control. So you only put the right heat and air in the right places or you move blinds automatically. Like those are, are huge applications where they're data driven. And when you figure out the right way to do it, it makes the expenses go way down. The operations department in like airlines and railroads are all about optimizing how many flights they can do and at what cost or how many trains they can send and on what tracks and at what cost. And data informs that process and the, the numbers can be staggering in terms of the savings. Uh, in the marketing world, being able to target people and offer them the stuff that you know they actually want is effectively what Amazon is all about. I mean, isn't it always suspicious after you look at something on the web that everywhere you go, you see ads for it on exactly the thing you were looking for? It's kind of the new uh, IT joke. You'll go to someone's computer and you'll go Google something completely not them. And then for the next two weeks, they'll see ads on it. That's all data-driven advertising and marketing. And I think people saw it in the movie Minority Report and, and got really excited about what they could do with it. And so um, whether you're doing literal, you know, there, there's a whole industry in terms of being able to walk into a retail store and based on where you're standing in the store, be able to make sure that the things you would be interested in shine because they can turn on lights and stuff automatically on the racks. So you, you see the shirt that maybe you Googled the night before. Like again, a whole industry of the data involved with knowing where you're standing exactly in the store and what products are around you and how to do that. Um, customer service, nobody likes talking to a computer, but these days what's interesting is the artificial intelligence engines going into call centers are sometimes more human-like than the humans. They are not bored, and they are all about trying to figure out what you want and help you get to the right person. And so some of them are actually really pleasant to talk to. It's surprising where AI has taken us that way. And ultimately, if you're calling in and you have a problem, the fastest way to get the problem solved is what makes you happy as a consumer. In general, the customer experience is really changing. So whatever it takes to be able to find your right customer wherever they are and to give them what they need in the way they need it is, is huge. Same is true if you're in government, um, being able to talk to your constituency and get them the information they need is, is big. The satisfaction scores go up and that happy people means happier government. I, I threw one on here because it's actually been pretty big for the last 12 months-ish. Um, there's been the whole, with the pandemic, how do we validate who can go in buildings and who can't? Uh, and there are whole armies of people running around with those um, laser-based thermometers that come up and try to measure you. Um, some places, there's just too much traffic. You can't really do that feasibly. And those devices have some accuracy issues. And so there's been a lot of um, data science going into how to write software so that as you're watching people walk through border control or coming through off railways or out of airports, not only are you validating their face against their ID to be able to say they are who they say they are, but at the same time, you're also taking their temperature to see whether or not they're sick. 
Now, again, temperature isn't the absolute if you're sick or not sick, and everybody gets that. But what they were trying to do is figure out ways to add health onto what was originally just access control. <laughs> and these are all examples of things that translate to dollars, either for a vendor providing it or for a cost saved or whole new product lines coming out. Um, I actually know a, a railroad in the West, uh, West part of the United States, that wrote software for themselves using their own data uh, to be able to optimize how they do cargo trains. And they actually got to the point that they wrote such good software that they actually started selling it to the, their competitors, the other railroads. Um, and they make more money sometimes on the rental of that software than they do being a railroad. It's kind of like their new digital you. Same thing happened with enterprise car rental years ago and the insurance rental market. Enterprise wrote the system to do it and gave it to all the insurance companies for free. And it made it really efficient for the insurance companies and reduced the cost of handling rentals for people. And so they just used the system. And of course, if you rent from anybody but enterprise, there's a surcharge for that, which goes to enterprise. So that's how they get paid. All right. So now we've got a question about, we're about to talk about uh, what you can afford. So our question now is about what you're seeing in terms of the cost of data storage in your organization. So I'm, I'm seeing some increases. Yeah, it looks like we've mostly got sort of moderate increases across the board. Okay. All right. So what's cool about that is um, there's actually one of the infamous technology laws that says that storage over time gets cheaper. And uh, it does actually, as long as you're talking about the same storage at the same performance level, it does get cheaper over time, density goes up, that sort of thing. And so what's, what's been good is that for people that are in, experiencing intense growth, but no change in performance, then ultimately you're trying to get to the point where it kind of cancels itself out. If you're seeing a modest increase, you're probably above that line, but there are some people who actually enjoy a reduction. Um, if you go to the next slide, Debbie. Um, but, but realistically, what happens in technology is people get tired of however fast today is and want to go faster. And we've seen a huge market in terms of wanting to go faster and faster and faster. And those things cost different. And so the, the folks that are trying to mix in super, super fast um, tend to see the numbers go up much more aggressively. And so we've, I, in my travels, I've met a number of organizations where the big panic is, okay, so let's say I accept that it's just going to get bigger. Let's say I embrace it. <clears throat> Let's say I know where all my data is and I know what's an important and I know what's not. And I, and I kind of have all of that pulled together. <clears throat> but I also know how many coins I have in my pocket. How do I afford it? What do I do when it breaks? And so my answer to that has been, well, how much storage costs, fortunately or unfortunately, is not an insignificant question. It's actually a pretty complicated one. And so... <clears throat> you have to understand what drives cost. And so I made a list of the, the main things that drive cost for you, but obviously the amount of storage you need, the capacity, the data you're trying to store, that makes a difference. The performance of the storage makes a huge difference. There is a really, really big difference between archival storage, which might be at a half a cent a gig or a tenth of a cent a gig, and the fastest NVMe storage on the planet, which might be at a dollar a gig. Like there's a huge spread there in terms of, you know, what you can get at what cost. Um, it also matters how often you access storage. Um, there, are, there are economics around the ability to get something 
once versus the ability to get something 10 times a second. Um, there's also compromises to be made in how long it takes to get the data. So in the, in the kind of an example in the older days, if you will, um, you wanted to back up this on tape out at Iron Mountain, you know, it's three days to get the tape. And that was acceptable. In, in the modern storage era, there's similar stuff where you can make a request for data and it will, it'll be there in a couple of hours. Not, not a couple of days, but a couple of hours, which is very different than the, I double click on it on my computer and bam, it's up. All right, so there is room to, to introduce these different metrics of expectation and alter costs based on them. Um, shared and dedicated platforms. So, you know, anybody who's using the public cloud and, so, and, and is making statements about how it's cheaper for this or that, the reason is those are shared platforms, right? They get economies of scale, just like people like Backblaze or Wasabi or Amazon or any of them get that. Um, and what's interesting about it, though, is when you compare those shared platforms, AWS versus Azure versus Wasabi, um, you still see up to 150% difference in cost structure based on who you pick, which is kind of big, right? So, um, you know, the length of a contract, the term engagement, who you're buying from, whether it's a file or whether you're doing asset management and object storage, or you're doing streams for YouTube, or you're just trying to boot and store a SQL database. Those things aren't just about what feeds the application. They look at the cost of storage. And so my answer to the, to the thought of how do I afford all of this is most people are looking at the environment in front of them now and doing the math and saying, I can't afford this because if I take my current unit of measurement and multiply by the change, it doesn't work. What I'm suggesting is it doesn't make it easier, but there is a whole world of options there. And most people are able to put together a strategy where you know, it's not hard for the user. It, it's potentially a little complicated to pull all the pieces together but generally, you can get to a number. You can get to a number that's sustainable now. You can get to a number that's sustainable in the future. And in this digital economy, you can even get to models that are operational versus capital, where you can make sure that you're keeping pace with the reduction in costs or the increase in revenues as it relates to the cost of storage. You can relate those things so that, it, at least from the organizational point of view, you're doing better than break even. It's just not as simple as taking today's number and multiplying by a bigger quantity. So how do we help? How does Maven Spire help? Uh, if you haven't met us before, and this is like a webinar kind of setup, so I don't, I don't see all the names in front of me. Um, so I don't know who's here and who's not. It's very exciting, actually. Uh, if you haven't met us before, we've been around for more than 20 years. And we are a problem solvers, we're challenge solvers, we're a consulting firm. And our smart as a service consulting kind of brains um, can help in a couple of different areas. We can help you map your data. We can help you figure out what you have, classification of it, the ins and outs of it that help you when you get to the costing model to figure out where you can put it, where it'll be okay and where it won't be okay. <clears throat> and we can help you maintain it. So if you want to just make it someone else's problem to keep track and store all this data, we can do that for you. We can help you with the advisory side of answering some of the biggest questions right now, help you with the strategic plans, help you to figure out what your different options are and which ones are going to get you the best impact. And I can help you figure out a business intelligence strategy and, and start working through it, which is really, again, about monetizing that data. And then finally, in the area of economics itself, uh, we can do the assessment on your current data storage, as well as figure out how to create a TCO and, and, a, and a strategy for data storage budget that's going to take you against your current growth curve. You know, if you need to be able to be a culture of yes, and you can't figure out how to get there, we can help you get there. We can also help introduce to you other um, financing and, and CapEx and OpEx and as a service models that can help break down and link increased revenue, reduced costs to the spend that you're doing and, and make that something that is actually very palatable to your organization rather than something that's big and scary.
so I would I would ask at this point if anybody has any question, please type them in. Um, I don't know if we have any Debbie. You would have to tell me. Look. I don't see any right now, but yeah, now is a great time in the Q and A's or in the chat. So, with that, I think our next uh, I think our next stop is uh, cheesy bread and wine. Let's. All right. Wait. You're, you're also, but sorry about that. There we go. Well, hi, folks. I'm Jonathan Nelms. I'm the owner of Tabla Restaurant here in DC. Chef Alfredo Martinez is with me. And first of all, I just want to thank all the folks at Maven Inspire for putting this together. Uh, it's a lot of fun, you know. Uh, Michael and I went to high school together a million years ago and have kept in touch since, and he's been a loyal uh, supporter of both Tabla and Supra, our first place. Um, Tabla here opened just about nine months ago, 10 months ago, Supra about three years ago, so taking DC by storm with cheesy bread. So I think you, you all got some instructions. I think you all got some wine, so we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but first of all, this, just to introduce you, Georgia, small country, uh, not a big diaspora, so the cuisine is not super well known in the West, although it's growing all the time. Uh, there's gone from zero to two Georgian restaurants here in DC, Philadelphia's added a few, Manhattan's added a few, few in California. So slowly but surely, Hachapuri, Hinkali, so the soup dumplings that Georgia's famous for are kind of taking the world by storm. But by far, our number one best-selling dish at both places is the Ajaruli Khachapuri. And so we gave you all some instructions, but I think it's always good to see a master uh, do it himself. So Alfredo, take it away. He can make a couple, and I can kind of, kind of walk you through the instructions. But first of all, I'm going to sit. He's going to probably be easier for you to stand. So you're just flouring the countertop and spreading it out into kind of an oval shape. And I, you know, it's something like, what is that, about eight inches by four inches, something like that. Then you take your cheese ball, to one cheese ball for each katapuri, you go cut it in half, and then you put it in these two cylinders. So you can see he's kind of lining a cylinder up along the side of the oval. And then wrapping the, sort of pinching it into the side so that you're gonna have uh, this long kind of snake of cheese that's uh, getting wrapped into the side of the dough. And the, the goal is just so that you have this oval with cheese along, so, along both sides. But then you have a little open space and, at the end. So Jonathan, I'm kind of adding, uh, adding folks okay. in so that uh, if they have questions, they can unmute themselves and ask and if they have uh, interesting bread making going on at their okay, place. Absolutely. We can see what's going on. Now, as you can see, you sort of pinch the ends together and then you can kind of make it round or however you like, but it's kind of like a, a boat shape. A lot of times people call this a cheese boat. So you can see that it, that we've got the, the cheese ball filling is along the sides. We haven't put anything in the middle yet. Now you take the shredded cheese and put that in the middle to sort of fill up this bowl of cheese, this incredibly, incredibly healthy dish. Really so now that's basically uh -huh. just going to go in the, at the oven, in a home oven, pretty much crank it as hot as you can go, 500 degrees or so, yes. about right? So 500 degrees, it'll cook. It, again, depends on how good your oven is at holding that heat. Uh, it could be five, six, seven minutes. It could be 12, 13 minutes, but basically you're going to cook it until the, the crust is just browning a bit, not too brown, but brown, getting a little bit of color, and then all this good stuff in the middle is melted. Okay, we do one more. Why don't we do one more? Sure. And just for uh, so you so you got you got one look at it. Now I think it's probably repeating the process is just a good idea to um, drive it home. So again, making the making the oval about four by eight inches, something like that. Hey, the can I ask, uh, is anybody on the call playing along at home? Are you, is anybody doing their bread while we're on the call? 
smart. They are, they're not going to unmute. No, no, that's, that's smart. They're gonna, nobody wants to, to be the first. But I think most of all, we've done these before, and I think people do a pretty good job. I mean, uh, I've been impressed by the results that we've gotten from our amateur bakers. And I'm an amateur baker, for sure. Fredo is a professional. <laughs> so that's why I'm having him do this. So again, yeah, you cut that cheese ball in half, two cylinders, put them along the side. He makes it look very easy and much better than when I tried to do this. But, <laughs> but the taste perfect, no matter how beautiful it is. It looks so much better than when I did. <laughs> it's like, how many of these have you made, Alfred? Oh, so many. Thousands in uh, three and a half, four years. All right, number two. Look how easy that was. And then, yeah, sort of pinch the ends. That'll kind of hold it together and give it a little structure. And then, yeah, just throw it in the oven as hot as you can go for. I, I just start watching it after five, six, seven minutes. But it could. It's fine if it takes longer. Just as long as it's not. As long as the crust isn't burning, you'll be fine. All right, so we're gonna put a couple of these in the oven and then we'll, we'll be back in a few minutes with the results. And then the, the crowning of the crowning glory of the Adruli Hachapuri when you put the egg yolk and the butter in and stir that in at the end, which is, is optional. A lot of people have questions about that. They say, oh, we're eating a raw egg, is that dangerous? Well, again, it's coming out of a 500 plus degree oven, even if it's from a home oven and it's 450 or something like that, it's totally fine. Put the egg, as you'll see, he's going to bring it out. It's going to be a bowl of super hot melted cheese. And then you'll put an egg yolk, not the whole egg, just the egg yolk is better. And then maybe a pat of butter or the equivalent of a pat of butter, half a tablespoon, a tablespoon of butter. And then while, right, as soon as you can, out of the oven so that the cheese doesn't set up and get solid, then stir it in with a couple of forks. And then that will more than cook the egg. You won't have any, you will not be eating raw egg, don't worry. But again, you, we'll, we'll show you all of that in just a few minutes. Sure, so you can't have a Georgian meal, certainly can't have a Georgian supra, supra means celebratory feast, uh, without Georgian wine. So the wine that we were sharing for this event is, is an amber wine. And if you can see the, the color, it's a really beautiful color. It almost looks like whiskey or apple juice. Um, Sometimes people call it orange wine. In Georgian, they call it amber wine. That seems a little more elegant than orange wine, in my opinion, and avoids any confusion. It doesn't taste like oranges. It certainly doesn't have any orange in it. It's just, as if, what is amber wine? Uh, basically, amber wine is, first of all, it's the wine they were drinking before the refrigeration before white wine was really possible. Uh, so when you're reading ancient Greek myths or the Bible or similar religious texts, they're probably drinking something like this. Uh, and Georgians still make wine the, the way they've been making it for 8,000 years, which is to harvest the grapes and crush them and throw them into a quevery, which is a, a big earthenware egg-shaped shaped vessel. I think, let's see if we have. Um, but it's a bit egg-shaped earthenware vessel that gets buried in the ground. Then they would they throw the grapes into that, and and then that's it. They they don't add any yeast. They don't really intervene in the process very much, except to make sure that the quevery is extremely clean. That's important. Uh, the yeast that lives on the outside of the grapes and is just in the air uh, starts a spontaneous fermentation process. And that's how you get, that's basically how most Georgian wine, or not most Georgian wine, most Georgian traditionally made quevery wine is made, the, the wine made in those undercraft vessels. So for, uh, the fermentation takes place over a couple of weeks. It almost looks like it's boiling, puts off a lot of heat. Uh, controlling the heat is very important because if it gets too hot, then you get a lot of off flavors. That's why it's buried in the ground. And that's why the quevery are limited to 1,500, 2,000 liters at most. Uh, anything above that, it would get too hot. So even in Georgia, where they're very proud of this winemaking tradition and where it's wine that we're very proud to feature, it's still only about 5 to 10% of their total winemaking. Most of their wine is produced in what they call European style with 
giant 50,000 liter stainless steel vessels just because that's so much more cost effective and practical. You can't really do this kind of amber wine on an industrial scale. You're just limited by the size of those earthenware equivalent. And so what I always tell people when they say, what is amber wine? It's, it's white, you take white skin grapes and you make wine out of them the way you would make red wine. And basically that means with skin contact. So you throw the grapes into that query together with the skins. When you're making white wine, you crush out the juice and juice from red skin grapes, white skin grapes, whatever, is almost always clear white. So all of the color in red wine comes from the skin. So you make white wine by squeezing the grapes, whatever color they are, and then immediately throwing away the skins. And with rosé, you would do a little bit of skin contact. And with red wine, you do a lot of skin contact. And with amber wine, you do a lot of skin contact, just like red wine, except instead of doing it with red skin grapes, you're doing it with white skin grapes. And so the color that comes out is just very different. So when you're tasting an amber wine, you'll notice it's, it can have sort of earthy flavors, earthy notes. Uh, I think about, dried fruit flavors as opposed to fresh fruit flavors. So whereas with a white wine, you would get maybe, you know, I think of like green apple and fresh fruits like that with an amber wine, more like dried apricot, almonds, and notes like that. Of course, all amber wines are different, just like all red wines are different, but those are sort of, a, that's sort of a common theme is think of, of dried fruit flavors and notes like that, but they're still dry uh, usually. And they're what George has been drinking for 8,000 years. So if anybody has any questions, I'm glad to answer them. But I want to teach you one Georgian word. It's not, well, two. I've taught you Khachapuri already. That's the most important. The second most important Georgian word is galmarjos, which means cheers. Literally means victory, but that's what they say for cheers. So to all of you, galmarjos. I'm going to have a little one. <laughs> yeah. So I have okay. I have a question. Is the is the climate and when I think about wine making in the United States, I think about you know Napa Valley, Sonoma yeah. Valley. Is it a similar climate in Georgia? It's a very similar climate. Yeah, they in eastern Georgia, where eighty to ninety percent of the wine is made, it's very hot and arid. Uh, basically, Georgia is sort of shaped like Tennessee. It's sort of a long, thin state or country with Mountains in the top and mountains at the bottom, the north and the south. And in the middle, it's almost like long, long valley. There are some mountains that bisect it into two halves, but that's a much smaller amount. Those are much smaller mountains. And they make wine on both sides of those mountains. But so most of it is in the eastern part of the country, the southeastern part of the country in a region called Kaheti. And yeah, it's, we were there in August uh, a couple of years ago and it was 100 degrees or so in the daytime every day. And that was hotter than normal. That was a heat, an unusual heat wave, but it's, it's quite hot there. And in the West, it's subtropical. And so you get different, you different climate. They still make wine there, but it's very different. There's a lot of tea, a lot of hazelnuts grown out there, a lot of other fruits, tropical fruits grown out there. Um, but it's a climate more like something like Florida almost where where Michael and I grew up, and you'll see the vineyards with palm trees next to them, which is seems a little unusual. Definitely a different climate, and the wines are different. A little higher uh, acidity, a little lower alcohol. Although no Georgian wine is actually very high in alcohol. So, but yeah, so yeah, it's a for a small country. There's an unbelievable range of diversity in terms of climate and agricultural possibilities, but, but they are, there are excellent wine regions between those two mountain regions, almost all the way across the country from west to east. That's really cool. Who else has questions? Feel free to just unmute yourself. You can turn on your camera if you are enjoying some of the wine. I would like to experience that vicariously <laughs> through you. I'm currently having a classic Zoom situation where my dog started barking at me uncontrollably. Yeah, I know that I've had, I've had those. That's why I'm not doing this at home. I want to, one of many reasons. I also don't have a commercial oven at home, but. I mean, not many people do. 
have a commercial. How many people? Do, well, and I should say, in our regular oven, it's kind of on the fritz. So that's 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 even more to the point of why we're doing this. Um, <laughs> is that we would be doing this in a toaster oven, which is definitely not the textbook <laughs> way. <laughs> well, I'm I'm willing to bet that people are uh, either drinking or cooking, and that then to try Those to move over and click the video or whatever might be might be very difficult for them. But I, I actually I'm just feeling a little envious because. I have two problems here. One of them is you're <laughs> cooking those demos and only Jen is standing in the room. So the, I know who's benefiting from that. And two, I'm personally gluten-free. So okay. hmm, this particular delicacy is not one that I have yet convinced you to figure out how I can enjoy. So I will. Yeah, I, I, uh, Michael, I, we've been th talking about that even since before you and I started talking about it. And uh, there is... Uh, uh, we we had a chef who had a lot of expertise with gluten free gluten free baking. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. But uh, we there are corn they, in the western part of Georgia. They do quite a bit with corn. Uh, so maybe we'll work on like a cornmeal kind of. Georgian does like chadi, which are kind of like South American arepas. Yeah, sounds delicious. Uh, I don't know. Man. We'll work on that. Mm -hmm. No pressure. So, um, and I know we're talking now while stuff is cooking. Um, Jonathan, I'm interested to hear, like, I know you went to school with Michael in Florida. Yeah. So how did you develop your interest and knowledge of Georgia? Well, when, I'm Georgian. When, when we, when Michael and I were juniors at uh, Winter Park High School in Central Florida, we had a... Um, exchange student from the Soviet Union at the time and uh, sorry Michael I'm dating us here but uh and he was from Georgia uh, and he would tell it he would tell you that he was not Russian and he was not Soviet he was Georgian and he he did speak Russian but his Georgian was his native language which has nothing in common with any language in the world it's not not related to Russian at all it has its own alphabet has its own vocabulary its own musical tradition its own cuisine its own everything a completely different culture and much more interesting than that is the completed Adjuruli Festival. So I'll take a break from memory lane. And so we have two beautiful, these are like textbook perfect Adjuruli Festival. That looks so, really good. All right, Jen, I think you have to do your visual taste testing. <laughs> <laughs> so when you get these, when you, when you get these at Supra or Tabla, the, the most of what we do table side, because it's, it's kind of fun, is to put an egg yolk right in the middle there. And a pat of butter. And then you just take a couple forks and then we just stir this in. So it's right out of the oven. And like I said, this is this raw egg is not going to be raw for long. It is cheese is still hundreds of degrees there, and it's you're stirring it in very thoroughly. And so I always say, just give it a second to let the eggs set up. But you, when it's this hot out of the oven, you almost don't even need that. So that is now uh, blended together now, and that will that will set up, and that egg is cooked now. So I'll just do that to this other one as well. But it's is definitely it part of the uh, floor show. Interested to know if anyone's cooking along at home so we can see what this looks like in a take two home oven. We're not scoring anybody either. It's okay if it came out as like a cheese blob. We just yeah, want to know how hard good. it is. Oh, that's yeah, that is true. I always say you, you can only mess up butter, cheese, and bread so much. I mean, I've I've had, I, I should say, I've made some azurulis that are not beautiful, but they they taste very similar to ones that are beautiful. And there you go. Oh wow. my goodness! It smells amazing. <laughs> so Chef Alfredo, thank you very much. Didi Madloba, as the Georgians say. Thank right. you very much in Georgian. That is, thank you very much in Georgian. Didi Madlova. Yeah, Georgian is a, an incredibly difficult language. Um, I've tried. I've made little headway, I would say, with uh, Georgian. When Georgi, the, the exchange student in our high school, was at our high school, 
one day he kind of took over our Russian class and was going to teach us a little Georgian and everybody's mind was so blown that it didn't go very far beyond that. Plus, just since they have their own alphabet, there's a little <laughs> barrier of entry that you have to yeah. learn the alphabet. <laughs> you have to learn yet another alphabet. We'd already learned the Cyrillic alphabet. Now you have to learn the Georgian alphabet, which has zero in common with any other alphabet and, and the vocabulary and things like that. Just nothing in common with any other language. So... I, uh, after meeting Georgi, I went and was an exchange student in the Soviet Union for the 1990-91 school year, and I was not in Georgia. I was up in the Russian part on the border with Finland, but still, my Russian host family talked a lot about vacations they had taken in Georgia. We would have Georgian condiments in the fridge, Georgian wine for holidays and things, and they would talk about their own Georgian vacation, and when I... I, I tried to go that year, but Georgia had already declared independence and any trains coming from the Russian part of the Soviet Union were getting shot at uh, once they got near the Georgian border. So I was on one of those trains, but we got turned around and I, I didn't get very close to Georgia because of that. It took me a long time. I think when we were, my wife and I were, I was a lawyer for 12 years and I was working at the Moscow office of our law firm. And... We finally made it to Georgia for our fifth wedding anniversary. We fell in love with it, just like everybody does who goes to Georgia. And ate lots of Georgian food, because in Moscow and in Eastern Europe in general, it's no more exotic there than like Mexican food or something would be here. Uh, it's Everybody grows up eating Georgian food. There are Georgian restaurants everywhere. So then when we moved back to D.C. at the end of 2012, we were kind of frustrated and surprised. Well, we kind of forgot that there aren't Georgian restaurants anymore. And one thing led to another, and we we, we uh, started one ourselves three or four years after that. So and two years after that, we started a second one in the middle of a global pandemic. So. <laughs> nice. Are you? That's where we are now. We're coming out the other side now. I think that things are things are improving. So I hope they're all improving for all of you at home and, and all of you and your families as well. Well, and I was impressed to see your pivot to making these little make at home kits. Like I think that's one of the things that the the pandemic taught everyone was, yes. you know, it's time to like think about your business a little differently and adapt. And I thought you that's did very a true. Very nice job. But yeah, no, we've done quite a bit of pivoting, and I'm sure you all have too in your own businesses. And Maven Inspire have. Uh, yeah, I think everybody in the world, their personal lives and professional lives, is very tired of the word and concept of pivoting. <laughs> We're, uh, but it, but it's been a it's been a very educational and helpful process in a lot of ways. As you know, painful but valuable, like lots of things are. So, I think we're we're in a good position now, and we're just feeling like, you know, the staff is pretty much everybody's vaccinated. A lot of the guests, of course, are as well. Um, they're gradually slowly opening up restaurants in DC and so we'll get there and we just invite you all to if you're ever in the DC area or if you live in the DC area then come by hey I want to I want to ask an unscripted question and if you don't know that's fine um, yeah. so of all the things that you had to pivot or, or come up with What's your favorite thing that you're going to keep? Like you would never have done it unless you were forced to do it, but now that you're right. doing it, you like it so much, you're going to just keep it. Well, that's a good question. I, I, I actually have an answer to that. Well, it's one of our newest pivots, actually, which is a wine subscription service that we just started with a company uh, called Table 22, which basically takes restaurants and other, mostly restaurants and bars and places like that and it does subscription services where you can sell wine or cocktails or provisions, things like that. So we are doing a, we have a multi-tiered wine program where we have a, a classic level for, you know, for, for wines like this that are, that are sort of the mainstays of our, of our wine list. Um, then we have a, a premium section, which are sort of our, our best wines. And then we have a funky section, which is for the, Georgian wines that are super dark or a little weird or just have some great story behind them. Or maybe it's something where we only have teeny tiny amounts because literally some of these wines are made in people's backyards in Georgia, but they've done them well enough that they're able to export them to other countries. And so that's a pivot that I, I do believe will stay. Uh, and it's one that's just starting. I mean, we, we are taking orders now um, through a, again through table 22 and i think the cutoff is april 30th 
to pick up your wines for provisions in the middle of May. And then that's just a, like a, it's a subscription service. So it'll be ongoing. So every month you can get two or four classic wines, two or four premium wines, or one or two bottles of funky wine. And that'll be actually a fun challenge for me as the person who puts the wine list together to think about what can we put in which category? How can we refresh that list um, once we can get back to traveling to Georgia as we plan on in July this year? Can we find some more obscure wineries or people making wine in their backyard and bring their wines back for, for, for this program? And then tell the story in a little more depth. We're going to provide some sort of background materials on each of the wine. Hopefully, in, in cases where I've been there myself, Maybe some pictures or notes that I took myself while I was there, or at least pictures and notes that our distributors took. Um, so I think it'll just be an exciting way to, and a more interesting pivot. I mean, we've also done things like you know, takeout. We just we never did takeout at Super before, uh, or at least not on any in any organized way. Um, but like everybody else, we got onto DoorDash and Grubhub and all these different platforms, and. Uh, and did that, yeah, we do Sunday dinner. That, most of yeah, the wine subscription service, that's at our other place at Supra. At Tabla, we do Sunday supper kits where you can get the ingredients for two Adruli Khatapuri and one of our starters and another food item. Um, and then you make the Adruli Khatapuri yourself and then have the other stuff made for you or, or in the case of the dumplings, you boil them yourself. But basically you get a little the baking on the Adruli is the only really hard work you have to do. And as I think you've seen, it's not terribly hard work. It's just that some people like Alfredo do it better than other people like me. <laughs> but it tastes good regardless. It tastes fantastic regardless. So that's never a problem. So for the wine subscription, do you ship also or do people have to come? No, that's just for pickup. Yeah, we're only able to do that for pickup. Yeah, we learned how interesting it is trying to shoot. Uh, that's, yeah, that is a, a can of worms that we do not have the uh, bandwidth, pardon the pun, to, to get into right now. Mm -hmm. So um, everybody is welcome to ask questions about uh, Georgian food, about uh, digital transformation and data. Uh, if you are, if you've made the kachapuri, I would love to see it. So feel free to turn your camera on and display your cheesy work of art. Or they could take a picture of it and send it to you. Oh, that's true. You could take, or I wonder if you can post pictures in chat. I don't know that you can, but Jen, I just want to say in case I forget, I really hope you have your cell phone really close to that because the shot is a little away. I, I just I need a close up of that cheesy bread for like like my office wall. So if you could just <laughs> and and also Jen, I have to say I, I fully expected you to cut into that and then get into camera and like demonstrate yeah. the eating thing. You know, like the it's very you elegant. Totally yeah. should eat it. I told her to take them home. <laughs> I'm sure she already had that plan. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> For but those of us who live vicariously through others, uh, like the gluten free set, yeah, like Jen needs to eat some of that cheesy bread right now. Is all I'm saying. That's all. It, is, it looks amazing. It smells so good. I'm sending you the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I have to, we'll have to look sometime and figure out how many of these we've made in the last four years between Supra and Tabla. I mean, it's, it's by, like I said, by far our best-selling dish, so. I was thinking, like, a rep that that would be a great food hall food, too. Like, I, I was just in New Mexico, and one of the, they have a bunch of food halls where they put, like, ten sort of restaurants in, and they all make, like, one what? thing, and yeah. then everybody gets the one thing. It's more like a Singapore market kind of concept. And I could see that being like a big, like, let's just crank out a thousand an hour kind of thing for the food hall. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's some good food halls in DC. And, uh, and we got a video feed. Is someone going to show some cheesy? Nope. Or is it a child? I can't tell. Uh, oh. oh, you're showing the picture that I sent? Yeah, I'm showing the picture. Hi. Hi. 
everybody's being shy. Yeah, I need to see your work because we might offer you a job. So right. you know, the DC hiring yeah, market is very, is very difficult right now where mm -hmm. restaurants are all struggling to hire oh, staff. Why is that? Uh, it seems to be that a lot of people have left the industry. A lot of people have left the area. A lot of people are collecting unemployment and choosing not to return to work, um, either because that's financially better for them or because they haven't been vaccinated yet and aren't comfortable coming back to work. I mean, I think everyone's got their own reason, and there's probably a lot of people with combinations of all these reasons. But on the on the on a on a Facebook page that uh, DC food industry. Facebook page that I'm on that a lot of people use for hiring and stuff. Right now, there's only two subjects that anybody is posting about. And about two thirds of the posts are about problems people are having with this or that state's unemployment portal. And about one third of the posts are people desperate to hire people. And that is all anybody's talking about on this post. So that's that. The vaccination part of it, it seems to be going away because I mean, all of our people are vaccinated. And I don't think too many people are having, are not able to get vaccinated at this point. So there are, I know there are some people that aren't interested in that, but yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to, to watch how it all plays out. I, I know that uh, my favorite thing for restaurants anyway that happened during the pandemic that I think is going to stick around is outdoor dining became more of a thing, at right. least in yeah. the area I live. Every They took over parking lots to be able to do outdoor dining. Yeah. And right. now yeah. there's a whole lot of talk about not going back because, you know, like if you're in Europe, people are doing it like all the time, right? Outdoor dining is like a normal everyday thing. But here, depending on where you are, it wasn't part of the culture. So having them convert sidewalks into dining rooms and streets into dining rooms Everyone argues about the parking, but but it's kind of nice to sit outside when it's nice out. And I, I also think that people have a broader definition of nice weather now. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I was I was amazed at how many people were willing to come to both of our places on really god awful weather days. And I was like, well, thank you for coming, but why are you here? <laughs> yeah, you're insane, but thank you for coming. <laughs> I mean, we, you know, we put out some, tons of heaters. We put up tents at, at, at Supra here at Tabla. We didn't really need to use tents so much, but lots of heaters, blankets. We, you know, giving everybody blankets that we would, wow. of course, wash every time. And I was, one of my jobs is basically bringing the blankets home and washing them myself at home. Yeah, so, Laundry. Yeah, I mean, it was like, that, that was another pivot that I, I'm not going to miss. But <laughs> The, the like glory yeah exactly but um yeah i think that that's uh, outdoor dining is was always a huge part of our business but the fact that it's year round uh i think that will stay i think i think we'll find ways to do it a little better to heat things a little better and then we won't rely on it quite as much so there might be some days when we would be more inclined to close it down than we were this year but you know dc is dc i mean there's days in December, January, February, when you're perfectly happy to sit outside. So, we, yes. we, where we, we used to put all of our patio stuff into storage, maybe we just won't do that anymore. We'll just not use it on days when the weather isn't great. Yeah, I noticed that uh, one of the innovations in the outdoor dining scene were these personal pods where each yeah. family got their own pod. Yeah. Uh, we only have one, maybe two restaurants around my house that actually do it like that. But everybody universally loved those because it was like a private dining outside in a pile. Yeah, it looks like fun. I've never tried it. My kids always want to try it. Yeah. They won't stall some. Yeah, it yeah, could be fun, right? Right out yeah. in the middle of the street. If anybody makes a mistake, they're like a ball. They just, you know, roll down the street. <laughs> <laughs> if, they're, if they're disgruntled, you just kick the ball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm not a restaurant owner. <laughs> Oh. oh, we've got a question. Uh, actually, the answer to that one is kind of. So our office is actually reopened for normal operation on May 15th. Um, at that point, most of our staff will have been vaccinated. And, um, you know, we feel like we can do things in a safe manner, although some rules still have to stay there because we invite external guests in and out of our offices from time to time. Um, but as a company, Maven Spire being a technical consulting firm, we have a lot of people who move around a lot. You know, they're constantly traveling or they're 
or they live in different parts of the metro area. So, you know, we have always used our offices as basically a place to be social and see each other and work together. And so I don't see that changing in the long term. Um, I, I also don't see us actually telling people they have to come there more often than they would have before. Uh, we definitely have the inertia of everyone getting used to and kind of moving into. Like people, the idea of a home office used to be people putting their laptop on their dining room table. And I think at this point, everybody has three monitors, three docking stations, three, like people have moved in to home offices. That's going to be a little bit of inertia to kind of reverse that flow just to get people back together. But in our case, we're just super confident that everybody likes being around each other, that it will naturally kind of even itself out to the right balance. Thanks for the question, Alan. How's your cheesy bread going? It's still on mute. It's all right. He's not started, not, he said. Not started. Okay. Well, I, I saw the chat. I didn't know if he was doing it at the same with, like, what a family activity. Let's make burning hot cheesy bread. Like, the, <laughs> <laughs> if you successfully make it happen, the child gets their snack and everything is great. And if something horrible goes wrong, frankly, I don't want to know about it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Mm, okay. And treat. We can project. Totally get that. Um, no. Well, uh, with that, I want to say thank you so much to Jonathan and encourage everybody to go to Supra, go to Tabla, absolutely check it out. And if anybody has any questions about uh, Mavenspire or uh, would like to have a discussion about how we could help you de-stress with more than just cheesy bread, uh, our website is www.mavenspire.com and uh, we, would, we would love to talk to you. So thank you, Michael, for your educational portion of this event. And we hope to see everybody in future events. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Bye, Michael. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.